already yeah. remember you've taken the questions good morning and good afternoon welcome to day six the final day of the scores soccer summit my name is Angela Bailey, hailing from America Scores Bay Area, where we have served over 2,000 students and partnered with over 80 school sites to provide free soccer, poetry, and service learning programming. Across the country, America Scores is working in 12 different cities, working with 306 schools, training, and working with over 1,000 coaches in order to serve 12,000 plus young poet athletes. Yes poet athletes as they are expressing themselves and learning life skills on and off the field. We are so grateful to have everybody here with us today. Special shout out to Alicia Yano for putting together such a stellar lineup of speakers, leaders in their field who are here to inspire us. And that is the point of the summit, to share information, to be inspired, and then to take that inspiration to amplify the message and take action. And there's no better way to amplify the message than to join womeninsoccer.org. It is a free online community. It's free membership. So sign up. It's a no-brainer. Also, special shout out to Goal 5. Definitely go check out their website. It is apparel for her. It's beautiful, innovative, and it's just about time, right? So in true scores fashion, I'm going to close our little welcome by bringing a young poet athlete voice in the room and reading one of our beautiful poems written by Isabel, a fourth grader out of Moscone Elementary in San Francisco titled Athlete Paradise. Soft grass and a single ball sway in the wind while parents shout and cheer to their daughters and sons. Itchy shin guards and long socks move as if cheering me on. As the cool water responds to my body, the sweat drop kisses my temples and whispers a sweet champion song to my ears. Pen and markers dance with the paper to appreciate our fellow players. Friday's hot sun brings blue skies and loud laughter. Rainbow shirts and alligator shoes fill the fields. Friday soccer is where you'll find an athlete's paradise. Thank you so much for attending. I'm gonna kick it over to Amber, our very own Amber, also from Bay Area Scores. Prepare to be inspired. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, hi, everyone. That was actually my student's poem, Izzy. Um, I really love hearing her work. I've been working with her this whole season for virtual poetry, but that is something else that we're gonna talk about maybe another time. But I wanna say thank you to Alicia for creating this space for women to feel empowered and talk about um, our trials, our tribulations, our successes, and overall our experience. It feels like a very incredibly heartwarming platform to be here and voice things that need to be changed or give out inspiration for others who need it. So I'm going to get right into this presentation talk. And so if you're here for learning how to optimize your health for get a better gameplay, you are at the right place. This is especially towards all, this is mostly towards all of our young female athletes. And if you are active yourself too, a young woman who is active, let's get started. So I'm gonna start with my introduction. My name is Amber Calderon Bugarin. And this is kind of just a visual, timeline of how I came to be here and mostly my two biggest passions, which I'm going to be talking about, which are nutrition and food and also soccer. So I started playing soccer when I was very young. I was four years old and I just continued being active all throughout my life, playing different sports, but I really, truly fell in love with soccer. Uh, at the same time, when I was very young, my dad taught me how to cook and just some background, I'm half Mexican, half Filipino. So we are really big on food and just the family coming together over something special on our plates. Um, so my mom actually really got me into sports and a little bit more background about like why food is so important to me was she was a single mom and I have a brother it was, and she was working full time. So it was kind of hard to always have the like top notch nutrition food because sometimes we'd have to hit the drive through 
to get to my practice on time or to get to school on time. But the main goal was that we were fed and we were. And when I was going on to high school, I actually went to an all girl school and I continued playing soccer. Um, and then I continued to not make the best food choices because um, at my all girl school, it was either hot Cheetos in the hallway that you shared with your friends pre COVID of course, or like cookies and sodas. So now that I look back on that, I just think to myself, if I didn't have a bag of hot Cheetos every day, would I have played better? Well, that's left to the unknown, but I, I continued to excel in soccer and I played in my club team and for my high school team. And it was an incredibly loving relationship between me and the field. I went to college in San Francisco. So um, I'm actually from Los Angeles, but I, when I turned 18 and I got into the University of San Francisco, I decided to uh, just leave and start something new, start something fresh. And I was really happy with my decision because if my education and my background in kinesiology, which is what I decided to study, really fostered a lot more love for my passion because I knew I understood it a little bit more. Um, so yeah, I went to the University of San Francisco and I continued to play a little bit in club, but it was kind of difficult to be going to school full time and having to work part time. If, if some of you don't know, it's really expensive to live in San Francisco. So if, if I wanted to be a full time soccer player, what like by trying out on the team that wasn't very realistic for me because I wanted to have a place to live and I wanted to have groceries and I'm really happy with my decision to work because it led me to more experience with kids and eventually I was given this opportunity to work with America Scores Bay Area and everything that I learned from kinesiology I was able to apply to my new job and that's where that lower left picture comes in so I Worked, started working with America's Scores Bay Area about three years ago. And I was centered in the San Francisco proper region working with both boys and some girls teams. But something that I noticed was that there are a lot more boys on the field than there are girls. And I really wanted to understand why. Continuing my career with America's Scores Bay Area, I started coaching club soccer teams with older girls. So these girls, they had a little bit more athletic background. They kind of knew how to do things like running and jumping and they knew the rules of the game. So that was um, a very interesting career switch because I got to compete more competitively instead of the recreational teams. And these girls have taught me so much um, about what is, why is it important for there to be all girl spaces? And that's what I'm gonna be talking about, how to optimize our nutritional health, because of course, nutrition plays a part in this whole timeline, whether it was me in college trying to cook for myself and trying to have the best mental state so that I could be well prepared for my classes or me bringing, bringing banana bread to my students. Um, nutrition and soccer has just been such a interesting combination these past couple of years. And I'm really excited to talk to you all about it. The main thing that I'm going to be referring to today is called the female athlete triad. So this is kind of, it's like a disease I want to say that affects thousands of women in the, United, in the US and female athletes all over the world, I'm pretty sure. And I wish when I was a, an athlete in high school and in college that I would have known about this. So if you are, a coach, if you are a player, a, a female athlete, if you coach young women, you need to know about this so that we can intervene and make sure that this is prevented because there are, of course, short term impacts, but also the long term impacts are detrimental to women's health. The three components for this female athlete triad, as you can see, it's like a triangle and they all connect, is first low energy availability from what we eat. And it's sometimes associated with eating disorders like bulimia and anorexia. The second part is low bone density. And this is extremely dangerous for women because we are more likely to develop osteoporosis, 
which is when the bones just become completely weak and you are very vulnerable to breaking your bone or having a serious bone injury. The third part of this triad is menstrual disturbances, which means having an irregular period. And the menstrual disturbances is an incredibly good marker for doctors and even parents or athletes themselves because we, sh we should be taught that if you are an athlete and you are not getting your period regularly, that is not normal and it needs to be addressed. Um, and also, this is all about having a, an energy imbalance. So if someone is having an irregular period, that is a clear sign that there is something wrong. Um, but so these are, I'm gonna be talking about all three of the components separately, but this is overall what I will be referring to short-term effects, which I had talked about a little bit before where uh, athletes could have low energy and they could be more, more susceptible to injuries because of the fatigue, especially with high intensity exercise like soccer or basketball and low bone density, like I had said before, is very dangerous for to develop osteoporosis. And menstrual disturbances, especially in the long run, are extremely dangerous because it can mess up our hormonal development and also possibly lead to infertility. And the first component that I'm going to talk about is low energy from poor nutrition. This can be, as I had said, associated with eating disorders and also mental health, but mental health I will be getting into towards the end of the presentation. With low energy from poor nutrition, I looked up the three most common health issues that women face who are oh, like about my age in high school, a little bit older than me. So this affects a lot of women. The first one is improper thyroid function. And the thyroid is an important gland and in the endocrine system that ba basically maintains all of the hormones that are going into our body. And this definitely connects with the menstrual disturbances because if our thyroid it doesn't have enough energy to perform properly, we will not be getting the optimal and the hormones that we need to develop properly as women. Signs to look for if someone is having a, a thyroid proper improper thyroid in function are weight gain, fatigue, coldness, and possibly loss of hair. And just a side note that all three of these conditions, a main symptom is fatigue or lethargy, extremely tired. So something that usually causes improper thyroid function is what we eat. And it's from a deficiency in iodine. Iodine is mostly found in salts, but we don't want to rely mainly on iodine or excuse me, on salt for our iodine intake because having too much salt in our body can dehydrate our cells and it's overall it's not good. But other forms that athletes can find iodine are in non-fat plain yogurt or eggs. So that's the first one. And the second one is poor bone health, which I had covered short a little bit briefly in the beginning. And poor bone health can be contributed to, um, to either low calcium or low vitamin D or sometimes even both. And what's extremely important about these vitamins is that they need each other to, to work properly. So if there's not enough low cal if there's not enough calcium, then vitamin D can't do its job. And vice versa, if there's not enough vitamin D in the body, then calcium cannot do its job to supplement nutrients to the bones. Some symptoms could also be bone pain, muscle weakness, and fatigue. And also it could lead to osteopenia, which is basically the first level before osteoporosis. Um, and osteoporosis is when your bones get a lot more porous and there's a little bit more air in there and it can't sustain high impact. Some places where we can find vitamin D is of course the sun. And I know a lot of us know that, but it depends on where you are actually with how much sun and vitamin D availability you can bring to your body by being outside. Because if you are in the city, for example, Seattle, if you're in the city, there's, oh, it's very cloudy and the sun doesn't like shine through during the, some parts of the year. But if you are in somewhere like tropical, like Hawaii, you're definitely going to get a lot more vitamin D. And what's difficult about take in taking vitamin D is that it's not found in a lot of common foods, but a very good source is actually salmon. 
So if you talk to your athletes about this, or if you are an athlete yourself, go ahead and take these recommendations and make sure that you're getting in all your vitamins with every single um, food group that I, I talk about. Uh, another place that you can find calcium is almonds and leafy green foods like broccoli, spinach, kale. I know that one's very tough for especially teenage athletes and young athletes because they don't like their vegetables. Like I said, we like our hot Cheetos, but um, if we make these into small habits, they will make a, a huge impact. The next health condition that a lot of women face is low red blood cell count. This one is extremely just very very close and dear to me because um a lot of uh, I can't even put words to it because not a lot of women know how their body works and it's kind of it's kind of sad that we don't understand it but red blood cells are um basically little vehicles in our body that carry oxygen all throughout to our fingertips to our brain to our toes to all of our muscles and organs since because the body needs oxygen to function and for that the chemical um the chemical excuse me the just the chemistry in the cells to function properly so low, low red, red blood cell count could come from a deficiency in iron which could also be contributed to menstrual disturbances since we women bleed and they get rid of a lot of blood that iron is in. So it's really important for us to keep an eye on this uh, as coaches and athletes. Also B12 deficiencies and folate deficiencies can lead to a low red blood cell count. Symptoms of this are extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, and dizziness. But places that we can get these vitamins are, for example, iron and kidney beans and cereals, not sugary cereals, but fortified cereals. B12 is found in a lot of meat and animal products and folate can be found in other leafy green vegetables as well as calcium. So it's kind of like they both go in together for calcium and folate, which is found in like Brussels sprouts or spinach. Now I've mentioned basically an information dump of where we can find these things, but how do I apply it to my players? How do I apply it to myself? We wanna be very intentional when teaching our teams, our players to be healthier. We need to be realistic with our eating habits and our demographic because of course the main goal is that we want to avoid injury and make sure that our students have high energy, optimal energy to perform well. But if we just tell all of this to our players, how is it gonna sit with them and how is it going to help them change their habits? My recommendation is check in with them, make connections, with your players before practice, like ask them like, what did you eat for breakfast today? Like, did you have snacks? Talk to them about how important it is to have high energy and how eating hot Cheetos and candies, it's gonna make you gassed out and you won't be able to perform well. Other recommendations that I've made to some of my players is maybe in the house, instead of having a bowl of unhealthy snacks, try to put a couple of pieces of fruit or vegetables in there so that that's the first thing you see and that's the first thing you grab as a snack. But as you can see, of course, that is just a very small habit, but we wanna make it very realistic. Also, we wanna be inclusive because me personally, I work with um, a large BIPOC demographic. So I know that their families are usually cooking traditional Latino foods. And we wanna, we wanna keep in mind this, that that's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to love the food that is from your home. That's not a bad thing at all. But what's super important is to teach moderation. You can enjoy these things. You can enjoy this time with your family, especially because we're going into the holidays. You can enjoy having tamales with your family, but it's all about balance. So if you're having one thing that you know is not so good for your body, but it makes your heart happy, add something else that is good for you, like a side of broccoli or have almonds as a snack. And it's all, it's all very tiny steps that lead to a bigger impact. The next part of the triad that I'm going to be discussing is low bone density. And low bone density is basically when the structure of the bone weakens and this naturally happens over time. But with women, we are more likely to, this process happens a little bit faster because of the hormonal changes that are occurring as we age from our periods and just our overall female biology. But 
the, stru when the, structure, the structure of the bone weakens because of a loss of minerals and a loss of dense, uh, density. And also if there's poor nutrition, that, does, that doesn't help the situation either. But the osteopenia is the first level before osteoporosis. So we definitely want to avoid these two by, I will discuss the examples, but also with uh, the nutrition that we had talked about and some exercise exercises that we can implement into our trainings every, um, every week or whenever you practice. And I included these exercises based off of Wolf's law. So this is not a theory, this is actually a law that's been proven. And it states that your bones will adapt based on the stress or demands placed on them. When you work your muscles, they put stress on your bones and in response, your bone tissue remodels and becomes stronger. So basically the more stress you put on your bones in the form of weights with exercises like uh, weightlifting or strength training, your bones will naturally get used to it and remember and get stronger. So strength train, I recommend from this law, including strength training regularly in sessions. And this can be anything. If your team is lucky enough to have a gym membership teaching the girls how to lift weights, how to do deadlifts, how to do good mornings, strength training with um, body weight, with such as plank circuits or ab circuits, and also sprinting, getting into those high interval training. Sprinting is very important for the type two muscles and they have to use their body weight basically to get over gravity. So that's an, another good exercise to include into your trainings. The next part, again, how I had talked about this with nutrition is we wanna present this inclusively and with intention. If we don't have a team can't afford a gym membership, then bring some bags of rice to your training and you can start doing different types of weight circuits with that or giant water jugs. Have your girls bring your their backpacks with heavy textbooks in there. There's a bunch of different ways. And by teaching them how to do this properly, this will set them up to continue to be active and eventually Maybe they'll get a job, they'll have some type of income and they can go to the gym themselves. And then you had taught them how to better strengthen their bones and their muscles. Next, the by weight training. Also, I want to, I want to touch on this. We need to steer away from the stereotype that girls should not lift to the point where they look like a man. That is ridiculous. I have heard it from friends, from family, and I just want to get something straight here for all my ladies out there and all of my coaches who are coaching ladies. This is actually physically impossible for women to, when they lift, to look like a man because we have 30 to 10 times less of the hormone that contributes to muscle hypertrophy, which is muscle bulking that men have. So unless we're taking steroids, it is not possible. And actually lifting weights has a lot of positive short-term and long-term outcomes, such as a decrease, a decrease in body fat and an increase in muscle, which makes more efficient breakdown of energy in the cells because it all starts from the smallest units. And if we have more efficiency and energy breakdown from the cell level, then we will perform level. We will perform better at the field level. Next, your bones will generally just get stronger. Our girl, we want to encourage our girls to be strong for that body to body contact and they'll be less prone to injury if they are stronger. They will also have more energy and less fatigue. Again, another factor to uh, less likelihood of injury because they won't be as tired. For example, with soccer, we have 45 minute halves. So by the time the second half comes, our energy levels will still be sustainable. Next, this decreases cortisol levels. And cortisol is a, basically a chemical in our body, which is from a lot of stress. And part of sports is definitely in our head and a mental state. So if our mental state is good and not as stressed out, then our gameplay will be a lot better too. And lastly, like I said, the body will remember. So if our body remembers, girls will be more likely to continue to work out and be active because their body is used to it. Another side note for Wolf's Law is that even though we add stress to the, as we continue to add stress to the body, our, bot, our bones will get stronger 
the law works the opposite way too. So if we are sedentary and we don't have this stress on our bodies, then our bones will weaken on their own as, and they're weakening already for women because of our hormones and as we get older. But if we are just not active at all, not applying any weight, then we will be even more prone to being diagnosed with osteoporosis in the long run. The, <clears throat> the last part I wanted to talk about isn't exactly about, it's not part of the female athlete triad, but I do strongly believe that it should be addressed. And that is our players' mental health. And sports is the perfect place to foster optimal mental health for optimal play. And the three points I'm gonna be talking about are the space, the coaching and how you connect with your students and also teaching and sustainability. So first, we wanna make sure that we have a safe and brave space for our girls. They need to know that when they're on the field with us, they can make mistakes, they can grow, they can, they can learn from us. Also consistency is a major component of successful and a safe space because I actually had learned this at a scorer's DC conference. And when we are babies in the womb, the first thing that we hear is our mother's heartbeat. And that is constant. So they constantly hear this type of beat. And we get used to that and we find comfort with consistency. And this is for all humans. So us as coaches, we need to really think about that fact and apply it to our practices by always being consistent. Me personally, I always try to arrive 20 to 10 minutes early. I always write down and prepare my drills and my practices, what I'm going to talk about in the training session. When my girls see that I am consistently there and they know they can expect and not be, be fearful of any surprises because I don't know what's going on in their life. I just want to be able to have something that they can rely on. There's a trust that builds and that makes the space feel very, very safe. The last part about the space is team cohesion because a team can have good chemistry. They can work well together on the field. They can win and they can pass and they can shoot together. And that's good team chemistry. But team cohesion is when your players actually get along. Do they actually know each other past their positions and past while uh, working together to win a game? If by having solid team cohesion, that'll just make the bond even stronger with the players. And team cohesion can come in many different forms, such as going on hikes with your players or having different little events where the girls actually don't think about the sport is a good place to start building on that team cohesion. Next, um, another concept that really does help a player's mental health is having somebody who they can connect with that is their role model. So a coach who connects, uh, I do these personally in my practices and I've been with the same team for about three years coaching them. I feel like so happy when the girls tell me like, coach, I love coming to practice because it makes me not think about what's going on in school. And that comes from me trying to connect with them. I definitely prioritize one-on-one -on -one check ins when we were in person. And also now when we have our COVID safe cohorts, one-on-one -on -one check ins asking like, how is school? Um, again, with nutrition, how is your, did you have lunch? What, what did you eat? What are you gonna have for dinner? Um, asking them these types of questions and it really shows that you care about the student as a whole because of course they're a player they're gonna, they're your player for like two hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays and they're your player on Saturdays but they have a whole other life past the field next we want to teach intentionally so of course I had mentioned a bunch of different ways uh, that we can implement intentionality when we are coaching our students and that would be with our exercises being aware like, oh, maybe not all of us can afford gym memberships. So maybe what are other ways that I can encourage them to lift weights at home, whether that be a backpack with textbooks in it or rice bags, which a lot of my students have actually done. And so that is the, a coach who connects. And lastly, teaching sustainability. I, I can only be with them for certain times of the week, but I wanna make sure whatever values that I teach them sticks with them. 
So I can't be with them when they're at home or when they're at school. So what are ways that I can teach them to take care of their mental health when I am not there? Some examples that I've talked to my students about is drawing, painting, journaling, being active in different ways. You can, you can still go to the gym and be on the soccer team. You can still try different sports. You can, you can do so many different types of activity. And you can, well, we're at home right now, so definitely a good time to be creative about it. And lastly, self-care. I talked so much to my students about self-care and it can be in the smallest ways. Some examples I've used are when you wake up, the first thing that you do is you drink a glass of water. Or with our nutrition and our food, make sure that at least one meal of the day, you have a good side of vegetables. And like maybe one time of the day, you snack on fruit instead of hot Cheetos. I've been using that example a lot, but that's the best example. And so I, I've, from my own experience with my team, I do feel like our mental health has improved as a team and individually. And that just makes me feel so happy for my girls and my players because their mental health is a lot more optimal so that they can keep their head in the game. And lastly, I'm gonna talk about how it all connects. So this is just a lot of information, a lot of recommendations on what to eat, um, bone density, a lot of science stuff, but how does it all connect in the real world? And my first point is knowledge is power. Now that you all know this, you have the knowledge to make a difference in your own lives when it comes to activity and also in your players' lives. So I, I really hope that this inspired you to have this conversation with maybe your friends who you work out with or who you wanna start working out with or your players. And I it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, I think that you should know about this and you should have this conversation with your players. And um, if you're not comfortable with having this conversation, then you need to find a parent who can talk to them about the female athlete triad how, it, triad, how it's not normal to have irregular periods, how it's important to pay attention to what we eat and how it's irregular to not have enough energy to run uh, less than a mile at practice. So I, and I also hope that you apply it to your own life, like how you can better your health and continue to be active. Next, of course, is injury prevention. So from the female athlete triad is all energy imbalance. So if our girls and ourselves have enough energy to supply for high intensity exercise, we can continue to play soccer till we're like in our 50s. We can continue to play basketball. We can continue to dance and we definitely, for me personally, I associate being active and playing my sport with joy. And that's why I don't want to get injured. I don't want to get injured. I don't want my kids to get injured because the recovery is just so long. It takes a lot of psychological help to, to get over that fear and return to the game. So we want to definitely avoid injuries. Uh, and like I, I just said, it's right now, we want to associate health with joy and feeling good. So just, we don't wanna restrict ourselves and our players because that just, that doesn't make anything very effective. But if we do small habits that can change, can make long-term differences, for example, like how I said, including like lifting weights at your practices with the bag of rice and putting, having your whole team make an agreement that they'll put a bowl on their dinner table with fruits and veggies to snack on instead of like gansitos and other chips and candies that could make a, they could associate being healthy with feeling good and feeling happy. And lastly, we wanna set ourselves and our players up for success. Time and time again, because I learned this in college, I think about if I had known about this when I was in high school, I would have excelled even farther. But I'm glad that I learned about it when I was in college because I was able to intervene in whether in act, either having low bone density or menstrual disturbances or low energy from the food I eat. And now I can continue to be active and I still apply this to my life so that I can continue to be active when I have kids and when I get even older. And that's what we want for our players too. We want them to fall in love with the sport. We want them to know 
how to perform well at this sport, how to feel good about themselves, and ultimately how to continue being active so that they can all lead healthy lives. Uh, the last thing I'm going to tie this in with is how this connects to our America Scores vision, because every single thing I said definitely applies to this statement. And this is our Scores vision and mission. We wholeheartedly believe all kids should experience joy, a sense of belonging, and be well prepared to navigate the future. We believe in a Bay Area rich with meaningful opportunities for all children, teams to play on, outlets for creative and physical expression, and pathways to develop their own voices. So let's encourage our girls to be strong and healthy by our mentorship and our guidance. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Amber. That was awesome. Learned a lot. And we do have several questions. And um, if you have more questions, please put them in the Q&A box and we will definitely get to them. All right, Amber, here's the first question for you. Um, once your bone density starts decreasing, what are some things you can do? As bone density starts decreasing? Yeah. You can start with gradual exercises um, that include weights. So I've seen smaller dumbbells and including that in your workout regimen would be extremely helpful, especially with um, overall body workouts, such as like squats with the, the little dumbbells um, or good mornings or deadlifts. That could be very helpful and also with what you eat. So by changing like small things in your diet, I know somebody had mentioned um, including supplements, which are very helpful. You can include supplements in your diet um, for vitamin D and calcium. And just, I always, my rule of thumb is always make sure you have greens. Greens are the, vit they're the vitamins of the earth and they just like help with everything. So that's what I would recommend. Nice. Well, I'm going to give a shout out to Serena here. Um, she's from, uh, zooming in from LA and here's her question. Uh, what are your suggestions for establishing these values and habits with POC girls teams who may not have the support from their families or resources? That's a really good question. Um, I would say be the role model. And that could be as simple as when you, whenever you come to practice, you have an apple and your water bottle in hand. And when they see that and they see that, because I'm Serena, I'm you're, I don't want to assume you are she, her, correct? I, want, I don't want to assume. But especially for girls, coaching girls, if they see you having these healthy habits, that, that really reconciles with them because they look up to you. And also just starting when they're young, it doesn't matter if they're in first or second grade, just teach them how, okay, it's, is it important to drink water? Is it important to take care of yourself? with small check-ins and like opening circles, closing circles, that could be a really good way to kind of get it embedded in their brain. Right, this question is from Deborah. Um, if you have um, an overweight player on your team, um, we're talking younger, maybe six to seven, how would you approach that child as a coach? Wow, that's a good question too. Um, Man, that's kind of hard because like you want to, the ultimate goal is to make sure that our students are happy, but of course we don't want to be our, our students to be unhealthy. So I feel like this could be taken as like a team approach, like maybe as a team, because harder training is, it'll benefit everybody, not just like one student. So if we start approaching that with like, okay, let's have a little bit more conditioning with our team because conditioning can only make us better or um, bring in a personal trainer and have a little session with them and then bring in the whole group and ask them like, would anybody wanna do personal training with him because they're offering it and you can create smaller cohorts so that that trainer or yourself on, on exercises not specifically associated with the sport um, they can work with them more closely and more personally. Okay, great. Um, this is from Kelly. Um, hi, my name is Kelly and I'm a high school teacher and assistant soccer coach at Ramona Convent with coach Aramin, uh, Romino Virgin. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that Maddie, right. That's my high school. Oh, yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so she continues. Um, I feel like I've become a broken record with telling the girls to eat healthy 
exercise regularly and get enough sleep? How do I get them to care about these things when there are so many other things that distract them? And what advice would you give to your younger self to pay attention to these things? Mm -hmm. Um, That's so funny because I definitely have experience with like kids being distracted with things that like are on social media. And that's, that's the reason why they stay up so late is that they want to like be watching all of these things and you know what? Crappy food is good. Tastes good when you're young and then your metabolism just goes and goes and goes and you feel like nothing's going to happen. Um, but I would start making it a priority that the team, I, I'm always thinking about teams doing things together and coaches too. Like before practices, everybody bring your healthy snack. Every That's part of it. You bring your equipment, you bring your water, but you need to have a healthy snack with you. And if not, we'll do a discipline. I don't know that just like when I do that with my players that kind of scares them and makes them do it and I know it's kind of messed up but <laughs> it works and they know they know it's all out of love so as long as you approach them with love and like let them know like hey I really care about your health and um this you're just not gonna play as well by eating all of these bad things for you you're gonna play much better when you have like healthier snacks and like drink a lot more water when you take care of yourself and eat better what actually sounds interesting is if you do like a trial run, like something like a, like a scientific study, be like, okay, for one week, we're going to try to do the healthiest things. And we're going to see how that affects our game. And then we'll return on reflect on it. Uh, Courtney has a really good comment here too. Um, show them that Alex Morgan and Crystal Dunn do it, you know, role models that all these girls probably look up to. For sure. Um, uh, another question, what if your teen is a vegan or vegetarian? Mm-hmm. How do you make sure they get enough protein? I was totally thinking about this when I was putting up the recommendations. And luckily, there are so many sources out there to look for, but I was vegan at a point. So it was kind of hard for me to find protein too and maintain that energy. Um, chickpeas are that was my lifeline for protein, just always implementing chickpeas. And um, I know there's definitely other fruits and vegetables that carry protein with them. And luckily for a lot of like um, fruits and vegetables too, there's something called complex carbohydrates, which it has not just sugars, but it has the, the carbohydrates in it, which is what we really need to break down and uh, excrete energy for exercising and activity. So chickpeas and other fruits and vegetables with complex carbohydrates would help with the energy. Great. Um, This question is um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, When the coach is male, how can teens and parents introduce the topic and initiate dialogue questions about female health without anyone feeling uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Um, So what I learned is to build rapport that if you are not comfortable with it, that energy is going to carry into the conversation and they're not going to be comfortable with talking about it. So I would first talk with parents and let them know your intention. Ask them like, I really want to talk about this, but as a male ally, maybe I don't feel comfortable with talking about it directly. Is there somebody who can, help me talk about this and have their parents there or ask them like, would your girls, I want to talk with you about this. Would you rather not have your parents there and have just one parent who is more knowledgeable about this and just me? Or would you want to have this whole conversation with your parents? Because I I really want to take care of your your health and you need to know about this. Great. Um, I think this is from Sierra. Um, Do you have any nutritional recommendations for athletes who are currently injured? Do these recommendations change when dealing with different types of injuries, tendons, ligaments versus bones? Mm, So, wow, good question. (laughs) Um, So for injuries, I guess it kind of like, when it's like a physical injury, um, especially with bones, it's like the, the bone structure that's damaged. So definitely if you like broke something, definitely a bigger intake of calcium and vitamin D, but for muscles or like ligaments, that's all just like tissues. So I don't think there's anything like very specific that I can think of off the top of my head. You, you honestly might have to look that one up, 
but just having like a balanced diet, drinking a lot of water when you are injured, you will be sedentary. So you need to make sure that you are, you are eating enough to supply yourself with energy so that you can like do regular things. Um, but yeah, I definitely don't think going on a diet or anything because you will be sedentary and you will be exercising will be necessary because by just having a healthy diet and being very conscious about what's on your plate, that'll, that'll keep you at the optimal levels for recovery. Great. Um, Deborah is asking, what age group do you coach? Oh, I coach a lot. I coach the little ones, the peewees, bumblebee soccer, and I coach, um, third through fifth graders. I haven't coached a lot of middle schoolers. They're, they're tough middle schoolers, but, and I also coach high school kids. So my high school kids, they're my club team and I've coached them since they were like 14 and now they're about all about to be 17. Great. Um, what, what is your take on halftime? Um, hmm. Energy drinks, water, do you think it's all, they're all the same or just stick with water? Mm, so energy drinks, the only thing I don't like about energy drinks is that it's like, it's sugar, not from like, it's um not very natural sugars. So I mean, like Gatorades and stuff, they can help you bring you energy. And I think that's good. But I think it would be better to just drink water and have that energy in the form of snacks, like orange slices, grapes, or like a granola, like a granola bar. Um, but I mean, you're working, you're going to burn it off anyway. So whatever your preference is, as long as you get that energy in there to continue and not be fatigued by the second half. Great. Um, this is from Deborah again. Uh, what pregame meal would you suggest? And is it different for different ages? Um, definitely when you are like younger to through high school, the metabolism is going off crazy. So having um, complex carbohydrates the day before and also staying hydrated the day before, drinking a lot of water so that your body is prepared to excrete all of that water through sweat and to maintain homeostasis, which is just like balance in your body. I, that is really important. I When I was on teams, I definitely had like pasta nights before, um, depending on the pasta and the grain, um, for example. So like white pastas won't be as energy efficient as like brown pastas and also proteins. So like turkey or like chicken and definitely lots of greens and vegetables. Great. That's like the day before. Okay. Um, switch just a little bit um, to the topic here. Um, this is an anonymous question. I have a tween daughter. She's an athlete and I see her eating less and less um, the more she's starting to care about her appearance. Uh, what do you have advice for that? And then the second part of the question is how to help her navigate through the beauty image and body standards messaging that she's getting, which affect tweens so strongly. Mm -hmm. Um, that is something that I have experienced personally, and I totally understand where you're coming from. Um, just like a little preface, when I was in high school, I started, I purchased something called Fit Tea, and I tried to go to the gym more on top of being active in soccer. And that was, I did that for about two weeks. That was the least amount of energy I had ever felt in my life. I felt like crap it was terrible. So it honestly is going to have to come down to like a serious conversation. Like what, what do you look at in the media and explaining to them, you know, our, our bodies are all different. And I know it's hard because in sports, especially with, with both girls and men, you are not only looked at how you perform, but you're also judged off of how do you look, which is so difficult when you're just trying to put everything out there on the field and people are looking at what you look like. Um, so having that conversation and I would, if you, if you make your teen food, I would like put a little bit of like protein supplements in there just to make sure that they're getting like enough of those vitamins and hide little veggies, hide veggies in their food. That's what I would do if I had, if my kid was doing that and have that conversation. Great. Thank you. Great advice. Um, this is from Dot. Do you have any recommendations for parents or coaches to ease the transition from tween to teen players? 
Ooh, there's going to be attitude. And you know what? We can't control it. We can just, as I had stated in our spaces, just make it as consistent as possible. Let like, and that'll let them know that they can rely on you. Um, but that one, I don't, I can't really advise you in much because hormones are going crazy at that time. And th there will be some attitude there, but they'll get over it. Okay, great. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, growing up, how was your experience as a player? Oh, it was amazing. That's why I'm here. I love soccer and just like talking about, especially like halftime snacks. Man, that was the best <laughs> for me. Um, but I'm, my mom is actually, I think she's on here. And I just want to shout out my mom because I just had the most incredible experience because of her. Um, some of my earlier memories are like of us Saturdays and Sundays, just like preparing for my games and making sure that I'm eating something and I have my waters. Um, so I had an incredible experience so much that it really set me up to want to continue playing in high school. In high school, I got to travel a little bit um, and play in like tournament cups. I didn't win in those ones, but I definitely had a good time playing in a different place. Um, and playing in high school was really fun and playing in college, I played in club, but it just wasn't for me. I wanted something more competitive, but I just didn't have the time capacity to commit to something like that. And I continued playing recreation. I still play recreationally, just not right now. And that is so much fun. All my ladies out there, I highly recommend you continue playing soccer as an adult because in leagues, they need you and then you get to play for free. So, and you get to stay active. So I, I had, it was, it's been so fun. Awesome. Yes, as Courtney's saying, mom love is the best, definitely. Um, let's see. What do you think? This is another question that just came in. What do you think about girls versus co ed teams? Do you think it's important for the girls to play with girls, or is it okay for them to go co ed? On, and what age should they start building you know, the sister bonds with um, all girl teams? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm actually talking about this in a different summit because it's something that we face at America's Scores. And I like the idea that we don't, we want to make it open to everybody, but a co-ed team is not necessarily as growth promoting as an all girls space would be. Mm -hmm. Because just with our social and gender roles um, in society, girls, they need a little bit more patience when it comes to learning the basics of soccer. And I experienced this too, as a coach, I've coached co-ed teams, but I've just, when I ask them, I ask the girls, do you want just an all girls team? And they say, yes, they, they want that. A lot of concerns is like, they, they're scared. The boys are going to kick the ball hard. The boys, sometimes they tell them that they're not good and that it's not a good space because the girls are not prepared. So I do think that at a very young age, an all girls space is detrimental to teach them the basics as like running, jumping, um, the rules of the game. So the younger that they start, I think the, the more equipped they will be. And then when they get older, they have the choice, like maybe do you wanna play with the boys? Do you want to be on this co-ed team? And especially as older girls for more competitive, reasons I do think it should be all girls because when it comes to boys and girls it's apples to oranges we can't really sit compare the two when it's two completely different types of play I um, totally agree with your advice and recommendations in that um, um, Kelly asks is America scores Bay Area only programs or programs like that and programs like that in Los Angeles and other parts of the country um, this is her first time hearing the program so she thinks it's great. Yeah. So America Scores is nationwide. And we actually have like kind of like another sister branch in, I forgot what part, in, I want to say El Salvador, in a different country. So we have a um, program in New York, Cleveland, Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, it, in a lot of major cities in the U.S. So. Yeah, I think we're in 11 cities, um, including Vancouver, Canada. So that's, uh, we're all over the place. 
<laughs> um, I think we're gonna have time for one last question. And this is kind of to sum up everything. The summit is bringing together top leaders in the soccer community. And we're all sharing and connecting with each other because we want to improve the game for women and girls, not just on the field, but off the field. What are your personal goals and what would you like to see the soccer community do in the next five to 10 years? Um, what I personally want to do is I want to help girls fall in love with soccer and just provide a space where they are happy, they enjoy themselves and they are challenged, but they persevere through it. And these lessons will help them ultimately in their adult life. I wanna, I wanna encourage them to go to college too and to further their, their possibilities, their opportunities. In the next five to 10 years, I really hope that there are more clubs who are, that are not expensive because it is a, has become a business and soccer is such a beautiful universal sport that should be enjoyed by everyone, especially girls. Because I mean, let's look at the US national women's team. Mm -hmm. we, we are successful and we are strong and we wanna encourage all of our girls to be strong for the next five to 10 years, whether that be soccer or another sport or going to the gym, whatever, as long as they're active and healthy. Awesome, that's great. Great. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with you or um, if your slide presentation, um, if you want to make that available, how can they get in touch with you? Um, they can email me at amber at americascores.org and I can put it in the chat or at least you can put it in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat for you. Take a second here. Um, any, last, um, any last thoughts or anything else you'd like to share? Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate everybody who came on just to hear me talk. Uh, I think it's, I hope I inspired you. I hope that you use some of these and apply it to yourself and your team. And this goes out to like all the ladies out there and the men. I really appreciate your allyship into making our girls future better and soccer filled, hopefully. Thank you, Amber. This was one of the best informative, insightful presentations, and you are a rock star. And I am very proud to call you a colleague. So thank you so much. I want to thank all the audience members for joining us and um, definitely our partners, Goal 5 and um, Women in Soccer. And we have three more sessions today. And like Amber said, she's going to be back with another colleague at 1 o'clock. Pacific Standard Time, is that correct? Yes, 1 p.m. Okay, I'm getting all my times mixed up here. But um, so thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you, Amber. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.